Hello and welcome to Middlebury 5.0. I am your host, Officer Chris Mason, and with me in the studio today is gubernatorial candidate Peter Gilbraith. Welcome to the show. Well, Chris, it's good to be here with you. Ah, it's, a, it's an honor having you in the studio. The pleasure's mine. <laughs> uh, you know, when you get into a campaign, right. uh, the opportunity to be for, before a camera is one that politicians rarely miss. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you know, they say the most dangerous place in Vermont may be between a politician and the camera. <laughs> <laughs> you get trampled. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously we want to talk a, a lot about your, your bid for the, for the governorship in Vermont. But um, I've been researching you a little bit and a fascinating past. It's an amazing series uh, of accomplishments and, and experiences. And I, I just, I'm too eager. <laughs> <laughs> to, to delve right into the, the gubernatorial stuff. I really want to delve into that, in, into the past. You've traveled to some really um, exotic, some very volatile places. Um, well, th th that's true. Yep. <laughs> uh, you <laughs> served as a diplomat and ambassador. Volatile places and, and volatile times. Indeed, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, like looking at some of the images uh, and, and reading a little bit about some of the things that, that you've done and be inv been involved with, it's, it's like reading the, the history of the last couple of decades. It's kind of the high points of, yeah, it, it, was, it was fascinating. I, I would imagine I mean, just incredibly engaging being a part of that and, and maybe a little bit terrifying at times. Uh, if you're a diplomat, which I've been for mm -hmm. much of my career, you know, the, the, where th these are exactly the places where you where you can make a difference. Sure. Uh, you know, when we have uh, normal relations with a, a country like uh, mm -hmm. uh, Norway, right. there, there really isn't that much that's happening. Uh, right. and so there are a lot of ribbon cutting. Mm -hmm. But when I went off, I, I was mm -hmm. the first U.S. ambassador to Croatia at the time sure. the country was at war. Mm -hmm. A third of it was occupied, and I was mm -hmm. also managing the U.S. programs in neighboring Bosnia because we mm -hmm. didn't have a functioning embassy. And so right. that, that created, I mean, there, you know, of course it was difficult. Uh, there were at least um, some moments uh, of uh, where scary things happened, but right. it also brought the satisfaction of actually being able to negotiate the end of a war. Mm -hmm. I think I'm one of very few ambassadors who not only <coughs> got to negotiate, write, and, and sign a peace agreement. In fact, mm -hmm. I signed it twice because the parties wouldn't meet face to face to make peace. Right. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> unusual, but sure. But the agreement worked. Uh -huh. That's got to be a really I mean amazing experience. I, I, it's hard to imagine anything that would have more meaning, that would have a deeper sense of significance than being able to participate in in something like that. Yeah, yes, I mm -hmm. mean obviously when you have a country at war, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, you know people who are you know who are really suffering, mm -hmm. uh, and you you see it all the time, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so to you know be able to do something about it that that is uh, that's really sure. important. And, but it's all, I mean of course I was I was in Croatia for five years or nearly mm -hmm. five years, and uh, it, it's also it can be very wearing because it's mm -hmm. it really is a single topic issue when, when, you, mm -hmm. when you're in a war zone. I mean, that nobody talks about anything else. Nobody really deals about any, any, with anything else. You can't do economic development sure. as long as the violence is going on. Right. And I know you spent some time in, in Iraq as well. And yeah, I, I, I actually first went to Iraq in, in 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It was during the Iran-Iraq War. Right. Uh, um, and went up to um, of went to Baghdad, saw all the mm -hmm. top leaders except Saddam, who almost never saw anybody, yeah. and went to Mosul and, and into Kirkuk and Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. And the next time, though, was 87, and the Iran-Iraq war had taken a turn very much for the worse for, mm -hmm. uh, for Iraq. And so I was there in, in Basra, the big city in the south sure. that was being shelled, mm -hmm. um, and then up to Kurdistan, where the Iraqi regime was uh, in the process of destroying all the villages and moving people to concentration camps. Right, and I know that you were a, a powerful advocate for the for the Kurds. Well, I was, you know, I, I think anybody, uh, anybody <coughs> who went there would have been, mm -hmm. but uh, as it turned out, I was almost the only Westerner who ever got there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to see firsthand uh, an effort to depopulate uh, an area that's, um, you know, several times the size of, of Vermont, destroying every village 
uh, you know, again, forcing people into concentration camps. And then mm -hmm. we found out that other things, even worse things, were going on. Uh, uh, there were whole areas that were declared no-go zones and you know, population. Any people there were just mm -hmm. uh, murdered. Uh, and then there was the use of, of poison gas. Right. Seems like it would be very psychologically challenging going through an experience like that, witnessing something like that. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, you know, it, 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 I mean, I think what you have to have in order to deal with it, you have mm -hmm. to have an enormous sense of, sense of empathy. Sure. Uh, you know, so, so much of the way we discuss foreign policy is about issues and abstractions. We talk about countries mm -hmm. or leaders. And it, it's really important to understand mm -hmm. that the, what is going on is actually people are being uh, very profoundly affected. And right. yeah, yeah, sure, you see it. I mean, I, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and there are just different vignettes. I, I was mm -hmm. in Kurdistan in 1991 during the uprising against Saddam Hussein. Yeah. And it was actually just when the Iraqi army counterattacked. And some people remember all the population went to the mountains, and mm -hmm. I was fleeing with them. And I, I just remember. You know, uh, people. Uh, you know, uh, in in cars, for example, where the trunk was open and it was just full of of, of people and mm -hmm. and the sense of fear and you know, up in the mountains, uh, the there were the children. Uh, at at this point, early in the flight, it had a bit of an adventure, and then days later, they were you know really dying. So, sure. uh, you, you know, that that's just those kinds of images are ones that stick with you. Of course. Um, yeah. I suppose you know it was a situation that ultimately turned out well, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, extremely well for the Kurds. So, yeah. you know, that makes it perhaps less difficult to, mm -hmm. you know, you see the the suffering. But when it turns out well, uh, you know, right. the situation is better. And you've gotten to meet some um, some pretty incredible people. Uh, I saw a picture of you with uh, with Benazir Bhutto. I think you were instrumental in orchestrating our release. Yeah. Well, you know, she was actually one of my two closest friends in life. We, we mm -hmm. met uh, on the first day at, uh, we were at Harvard together. Right. Uh, she, was, uh, she was just 16, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were friends from that point on. We were at Oxford together, and then uh, she went back to Pakistan. She was really planning to become a diplomat, and then right. the, her father, who was the prime minister, was overthrown, and the military dictators, uh, Mohammad Zia Hawk, hanged him. Mm -hmm. and, and so she went back to Pakistan having you know, had this eight-year experience at Harvard and Oxford to a completely different world, and and she was th thrown in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, they they really tried to kill her, uh, and the U.S. the Reagan administration, uh, you know, re uh, wouldn't wouldn't meet with any member of her family. Mm -hmm. They they didn't want to alienate the uh, Zia dictatorship. Uh, but you know, she what was extraordinary about her was the courage. Mm -hmm. I mean, she 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 knew the risks that 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 she was facing, right? And and she just carried on. I mean, I I think of a it was almost a as a friend, a mutual friend said in a eulogy mm -hmm. that after she was murdered in 2007 that sure. she was really a Homeric figure. She knew mm -hmm. her fate, uh, and uh, she didn't try to change it. She mm -hmm. just carried on. Tremendous heroism. Yeah. Now, really, the the yeah. the, the, the <coughs> most courageous person I've ever known was Benazir mm -hmm. Bhutto. Uh, and her greatest triumph was uh, after 11 years of struggle against dictatorship, uh, forcing free elections, mm -hmm. which she won. Uh, and uh, you know, and I, I was there with her in mm -hmm. her parliamentary constituency in Larkana. There were about eight or nine people in a small right. living room. Mm -hmm. She was getting the returns precinct by precinct in Pakistan. Right. And, and then we left the, the next day, and it was like 25 miles to the little regional airport. And there were people lined ten deep on either side of the road. Wow. Got on a, just the normal commercial flight. Mm -hmm. Arrived in Karachi, Pakistan's largest city. There probably were a million people at the airport. It was just the, the most extraordinary scene. And, and that was really her her greatest moment. Mm -hmm. uh, she was 35 years old, uh, but she had defeated the dictatorship. Mm -hmm. She had restored democracy. I always <coughs> pointed out to her that in, in, in that single year, single 12-month period, she'd gotten married, she'd, <laughs> she'd built a house, she had right. written and published a best-selling book, <laughs> uh, she'd 
had a baby. She had mm -hmm. conducted a <coughs> national political campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, she was elected the first woman to lead an Islamic country, and that was her very first job. <laughs> 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 all, all in one year at age right. 35. So se several lifetimes worth of accomplishments. Uh, just things that they would take that the rest of us. You know, we, sure. we'd, we'd spend several <laughs> years on that house. Mm -hmm. we, I, I mean, I wrote, uh, written mm -hmm. several books, and mm -hmm. it's a long process. Indeed. And, and uh, uh -huh. you know, uh, having kids, <laughs> mm -hmm. that could, that's a full-time project. Uh, but she did all of them, never mind mm -hmm. running for office. Sure. It pales, uh, what she did pales in comparison to what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do. I mean, right. thank goodness Vermont's a small and friendly place <laughs> relative <laughs> to Pakistan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that all, all that travel uh, puts it in perspective. But oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've traveled to, to a few places myself, and, and a, a lot of those places have been in a state of conflict and it, it really it does help provide you with some perspective coming back to to the US after experiencing something like that well that this mm -hmm. was really the most important thing for me I, mm -hmm. I mean obviously experiences in Kurdistan dealing mm -hmm. with Pakistan uh, uh, in Croatia for five years I was also in East Timor just after mm -hmm. the massive violence there right and then in Afghanistan where there's always a war mm -hmm. and for when all those assignments, I would always come home to Townsend, to Vermont, yeah. because it was the opposite. It was a place of, of, of peace and beauty, mm -hmm. you know, where, where you knew your neighbors and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, you, you liked them and, and sure. you felt very safe. I mean, that, mm -hmm. I mean, that, and all the other thing I understand from traveling around the world and not just mm -hmm. in, in war zones, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, in other places, Vermont really is uh, unique. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there aren't very many places that have, uh, you know, this the sense of community we have mm -hmm. here that have have so much space. I had a Dutch TV crew come to my house at one point to interview me about Afghanistan, yep. and and uh, they, they were the, there was the sound man, and he was he, he couldn't believe he said you know it, there's not a place so quiet in my entire country. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's that. Yeah, there there right. really are special qualities to Vermont, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know, sure. that's what I'm running for governor to um, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> to promote, protect, and and uh, so we do it better. Right. Yeah, I, I would say that that um, that's definitely my impression as well. That that's one of the things that I appreciate most about Vermont. I value most about Vermont. It's one of the things that drew me to the state. But I, I think that sense of engagement the sense of involvement people have and the connections between people in Vermont, it, it's, um, it's even stronger than, than I had a sense of before well, you, I came you, here. You see it in, mm -hmm. in our, our, our government. I mm -hmm. mean, here we are, a state of, of 600,000 people. Mm -hmm. Well, we have uh, 180 legislators. But right. it, it is, we have, uh, what, 251 towns and mm -hmm. uh, um, seven uh, gores and other orga unorganized places, and each of them have uh, select boards of three to five to or seven people. Uh, there are uh, uh, school, you know, some several hundred uh, school boards, mm -hmm. uh, each with uh, three, five, seven members. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, each of the towns have cemetery commissioners. Mm -hmm. They have three or four listers. I mean, it, it is an extraordinary number of people who are involved in governance, all of whom are are, are basically volunteers or minimally mm -hmm. paid. Sure. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it, it, in some ways, it's an extraordinary tax mm -hmm. on the population, but, but people do it willingly. And, and I don't think we actually appreciate sufficiently um, th those kind of contributions. I, I mean, in, in many towns like Townsend, you know, mm -hmm. there's the volunteer fire department. I mean, it, it is volunteer. Right. Uh, and, and I suppose, mo I'm sure most of the towns in Vermont mm -hmm. have volunteer fire departments. They I do in Middlebury. Oh, it's okay, sure. even yeah. in Middlebury, mm -hmm. yeah. Even in Middlebury. Yeah. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. th you know, and they're the people, they, they do the training, they, mm -hmm. they, they go to the meetings, and, and then they're going at all hours mm -hmm. for whatever problem, from somebody's right. alarm, who's, which has gone off mm -hmm. uh, when nothing has gone on, to actually having to deal with a fire or some other emergency. Sure. And that it feels like how it should be. It feels like feels like democracy, it, it feels like American society as, as, it was, as it was intended, as it was envisaged. People involved, people forging their the destinies and taking control and taking responsibility as well. And it's so, it's so contrary to the, the image in, in the wider nation of, of the way that government functions. Um, it's, it's gotten such a, such a bad name, it's so, um, so vilified. 
And that just doesn't seem to be the way here. And there seems to be a lot of access as well. There's a lot of communication. Well, it, it mm. is certainly a place where uh, anybody can call up their right. state representative or yeah. state senator or mm -hmm. even reach their governor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the people have listed telephone numbers. They, they get mm -hmm. back to you. Right. Uh, so all that's true. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say, uh, having served two terms in Montpelier as a senator from Wyndham County, yep. um, our government is not quite as clean as we wish it were. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are, there are a couple of problems. Uh, right. One is the extraordinary role of um, lobbyists and corporate interests okay. in, in, in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what you have when you're in a, a committee uh, and a piece of legislation is being considered, mm -hmm. the, ch the chair of the committee may not say to the, the senators who are sitting around the table, what do you think? He'll say, here's a proposal, and then he'll ask the people in the back of the room, which are the lobbyists, you know, the, mm -hmm. the person representing the ski areas, the grocers, the telecommunication industry. Right. Was this okay with you, Ted, Bob, Jane? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's not even the way it is in Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. And so to me, that's certainly one area where right. we should look for some reform. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not quite the responsibility of the governor because its legislature has to police itself. Mm -hmm. But really, you know, everybody ought to be able to give in their say once mm -hmm. uh, and then leave it to the elected representatives to do their the business. Right. And the lobbyists, of course, will be in the room. They can always pull you out. But the notion that they should participate in the what's called markup, the amending of a bill, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, that's gone way too far. Sure. And the other thing that happens in, in Vermont is the way we finance our campaigns. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, unlike uh, for federal campaigns and unlike even a state like Texas, uh, corporations can contribute directly to Vermont candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the, I think the conventional view would be that they're trying to buy influence. But the reality is a little different. It is that the uh, politicians know that the corporations are an easy source of money. If you have business before the state, mm -hmm. politician asks you for money, you're not going to turn her or him down. Right. And, uh, and, but then the politicians then trim their positions to accommodate their donor. Uh, and so you, you so often see in, the, in our legislative process where a single special interest triumphs over the broader public interest. And mm -hmm. that's why one of the centerpieces of my campaign is to ban uh, direct corporate campaign contributions. I'm the, I'm mm -hmm. the only candidate who in all my campaigns has never accepted corporate money. Right. And uh, you know, when I was in the Senate, I uh, led the fight to ban them. I, I, mm -hmm. I didn't succeed, but at least I forced votes. And at mm -hmm. one point, they, the senators voted 20 to 10 to ban them on second mm -hmm. reading, but then on final passage, they predictably changed right. their minds and voted 10 to 20 mm -hmm. to keep them. Seems like it would be, it would be a tough thing to get through because because you're battling against the money, you're battling against the interest, and of course, the money and the and the interests are going to exert all their influence to prevent you from doing that. Well, <laughs> I, I would, <laughs> I would assume. So. It, it, you bet. <laughs> uh, you mm -hmm. know, it, uh, uh, it, when you're dealing with other issues, there's mm -hmm. a certain level of abstraction. But when you're going after a politician's money, you're going after what's near and dear to his heart, and right. and that's what. It, the problem with, with trying to end corporate campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I will say, mm -hmm. I, I if I win, because uh, I've been campaigning on this issue, I think right. there will be a mandate saying that Vermonters are fed up. And of course, the, the Bernie Sanders campaign mm -hmm. uh, is part of it. Right. So um, I, think, I, think there, I think there is a chance that we might be able to do this in the next legislative session. Right, yep. So you've been a senator now. F you're not a senator currently, but no. you were a senator for two terms up until 2015. Exactly. Last year. Um, what were there issues that that defined your your terms as as a senator? Were there things that that really kind of galvanized you? Uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I already mentioned the effort to try and get corporate money out of our right. politics. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, a, another issue, in fact, mm -hmm. really the, one of the reasons I wanted to be in the Vermont Senate was the opportunity to um, go to a system of universal publicly financed health care, mm -hmm. uh, which exists in uh, every uh, industrial country in the world, uh, right. and which I 
benefited from mm -hmm. when I was in your original homeland, a student <laughs> in, at Oxford in England, <laughs> and England, used yep. the, the National Health Service, which sure. was which was good. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I had uh, supported the Vermont Act 48, which became mm -hmm. law to create a, a single-payer health care system. But it, 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 it began to occur to me that the governor wasn't serious about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when he didn't come forward with a financing plan, I offered a financing plan in 2014, the only, mm -hmm. actually the only elected official to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're going to if you're going to have a plan, you also should have a, the financing with it. So that was something I did in the Senate, mm -hmm. and now as a candidate, I've been putting forward several options now, for example, to have a public option on the exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that uh, Hillary Clinton has said that she would support. Uh, mm -hmm. It requires waivers. Uh, but uh, other uh, options included uh, uh, providing for universal publicly financed primary care. Mm -hmm. The idea would be that if you, uh, if you're, if you're something's wrong, you at least have a primary care doctor. And uh, you know, often, if you catch things early, mm -hmm. uh, they don't develop into something more serious, and, and so the whole system saves money. Right. Yep. Uh, a, another choice would be to say that everybody under 26 is on, is on Dr. Dinosaur, mm -hmm. uh, and so nobody needs to have a family plan. That would save money for, uh, for uh, individuals, and at least with children and uh, mm -hmm. a, a married couples, they will only have to get a couple plan rather than a family plan, uh, and then everybody else would have up to age 26 free health care, much in the way seniors do under Medicare. Uh, both of these things could be financed with a payroll tax of about 2%. Right. Uh, right. The other issue that I pursued very strongly when, it, when, I, when I was in the Senate, and that mm -hmm. is the centerpiece of my campaign for governor, is raising the minimum wage. In, mm -hmm. in uh, the Senate, I proposed a, a $12 minimum wage mm -hmm. uh, but to go immediately. But now what I'm saying is let's go to 1250 in 2017 and to $15 by 2021. Mm -hmm. And th the thing about the minimum wage is that uh, it's the best anti-poverty program you could have. You know, we have a lot of talk uh, about making Vermont affordable, but sure. frankly, it's affordable for people at the top of the income spectrum. Even if their taxes go up a lot, a little bit, they, they mm -hmm. can still afford it. The people for whom it's not affordable are those at the bottom of the income spectrum. Right. And so giving a, mi a minimum wage worker a 50% pay increase Mm -hmm. It's going to make uh, life more affordable, it'll make housing more affordable, uh, and it will be good for the local economy because mm -hmm. low-wage workers spend all their extra money and they spend it locally. Mm -hmm. you know, again, more money to, to well-off well people, they save it, they, they'll spend it someplace else. Right. But, and the uh, final point is it'll be good for taxpayers because right now taxpayers subsidize low-wage employers because uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you go to work for Walmart and they, right there, they're signing you up for all the public assistance program, and there's also something called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which will mm -hmm. get, which other taxpayers give additional money to low-wage uh, workers. Well, right. you raise the, the uh, minimum wage, the fewer people get the Earned Income Tax Credit, it would mm -hmm. save $18 million. Okay. So that's, a, that's another issue that I was working on both in the Senate and as central to my campaign for governor. Right. So you, you're a Democrat. I am. This is a Democratic primary. It is on August up. 9th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it that um, that defines for you being a Democrat? What, what's your vision of, of a Democrat? Because I think that there's a lot of people trying to define what a Democrat is and what a Democratic candidate is, and, and you know we're seeing a lot of vitriolic statements <laughs> about <laughs> what it means to be a Democrat. But w what does it mean to you to be a Democrat? How would you define well, that? Well, the, <coughs> the Democratic Party is mm -hmm. actually the oldest political party in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in its modern form, it's, for me, defined by Franklin Delano Roosevelt mm -hmm. uh, and the New Deal, you know, right. the notion that uh, we take care of everybody from, uh, you know, kids, Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to seniors with social security, so that when mm -hmm. there's unemployment, you 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 just you aren't just standing in a the bread line or starving. You know there's unemployment insurance. Uh, the government comes in and and uh, you know provides public uh, jobs. And think of all the wonderful things that were accomplished during the Great Depression by the public sector, including mm -hmm. you know 
the, the Lawn Trail and, and mm -hmm. many of the um, public amenities that we have here in the state of Vermont. Um, so that's one thing, and, and then the you know the civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, e equality, civil rights in the in the '60s, and I remember those days vividly. Mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, you know, uh, rights for uh, same-sex couples, which is you mm -hmm. know now with President Obama, mm -hmm. uh, expanding health care under President Obama. So mm -hmm. those are the things that that I think define the the values of mm -hmm. the Democratic Party. Uh, uh, sure. I will say we don't always live up to them, mm -hmm. and I've. You know, probably more than any senator, I challenged my own party because mm -hmm. I, I didn't think we were living up to them. Right, and and what I mean, you've you've mentioned a, a few people, but I'm wondering what are there figures that have really inspired you in terms of like who you've become and the the values that you've embraced and the kind of character that you have. I, uh, you mentioned Benazir Bhutto well, and, and Roosevelt, for, of course, for, for sure. Yeah. Benazir Bhutto mm -hmm. uh, and, and Roosevelt was a historic figure. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a child when John F. Kennedy was, a pr mm -hmm. was president, and, and my father had served as his ambassador to India, Robert right. Kennedy. Now you got to meet um, Ms. Gandhi. Or oh, Indira. I've, met, yeah. I've met, met almost all the prime ministers <laughs> of India, <laughs> Nehru, mm -hmm. uh, Indira Gandhi, oh, right. uh, Rajiv mm -hmm. Gandhi, uh, mm -hmm. her son, who also became prime minister. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you, though, a couple of other people who have mm -hmm. inspired me. Uh, they're my mother and father. Right. My mother um, comes from an old Vermont family mm -hmm. uh, that goes back to the original settlers of mm -hmm. uh, Burlington. And right. one of the relatives was Jeremiah Atwater, the first president of Middlebury College. Okay. But, she, but she, uh, mm -hmm. she went to Smith on a scholarship. She studied German and uh, French. And then she got a scholarship to go to Germany in 1933 to Munich. Wow. And you know, there, Hitler what a time had, to be in Germany. Yeah, Hitler had just come into power. <laughs> uh -huh. And she, you know, she, she got it. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she saw those Aryan race laws, and, sure. and she saw the discrimination. There are a lot of people mm -hmm. who, who didn't. And, and uh, oh, just before she died, we were there reading her diaries from those days. They were so, mm -hmm. so astute and moving. And she became, you know, a champion for civil rights here. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, was a uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, he actually was uh, uh, probably the most widely read American economist uh, of the 20th century because mm -hmm. he understood that economics is uh, it's called the dismal science but <laughs> but the way it's done by most academics it's also the impenetrable science because mm -hmm. you can't get through the statistics he he right. made it he made it readable mm -hmm. uh, and he he, he, he kind of launched a revolution he had a book called the affluent society in 1958 mm -hmm. that was a super bestseller and it it argued that uh, we were heading America was becoming a place of, of private affluence and public squalor, mm -hmm. uh, and that we needed to, to change that. And he argued right. for investments in protecting the environment and the arts, the, thing, the, the things that make our lives more livable. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, he, in many ways, he helped create the modern environmental movement. So I'm really mm -hmm. very proud of him. He was yeah. uh, also somebody who he, 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 brought, he was, was Kennedy's ambassador. He was close mm -hmm. to Lyndon Johnson. He broke with him early over the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, and and he you know he always took a principled position against uh, uh, so many of our reckless foreign policy right. ventures, and and that that too inspired me. They sound like profoundly inspiring people. Yeah, I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. They lived until their uh, my mother ninety five, mm -hmm. my father ninety seven. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's always slightly frustrating to be the the son of, particularly in my father's case, right. such a famous person. I would imagine. But, <laughs> but the worst of it is that, he, you know, he was almost always right. <laughs> it, it made rebellion <laughs> quite right. difficult. Infuriating. I, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm having, um, you know, I, I think that I'm, I'm hoping my son will have the same difficulty. <laughs> Well, thank he, he's here in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Yeah. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show, Peter. It's been such a pleasure. Well, Chris, the pleasure has been mine. And fascinating, too. And, uh, good luck with the, with the candidacy. Well, thank you. And I just hope everybody watching will remember to vote mm -hmm. on August 9th in the Democratic primary. And take a look at my website, mm -hmm. GalbraithForVermont.com. Okay. So until next time, drive safe and may all your mischief be of the lawful persuasion. <laughs>